on. Good, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Tim Smith. I am with the Office of Naval Intelligence where I've served as what you can broadly refer to as an analytic methodologist for many years, the kind of an architect of various different uh, methods, tools and techniques to accomplish two general objectives, uh, both uh, modes of learning. One is uh, intelligence analysis and production, and the other is to uh, train the analytic cadre uh, in uh, fundamental military understanding, when many of them bring uh, uh, only a civilian uh, education into their work. So the simulation-based analysis and training program is designed to support uh, that uh, requirement and, uh, and give analysts, uh, in the first place, their, their first really fundamental understanding of a warfare fundamentals, typically at the operational level of war, uh, and uh, then for production analysis with uh, computational simulation to provide for uh, the production of uh, intelligence. So you'll see here, the images that I've portrayed are actually very simple war games. Uh, as we'll be explaining, it was a uh, uh, kind of a learning lesson to understand how important it is to keep the, uh, the junior level training accessible to all and to uh, and the, the amount of learning you can in fact convey in relatively simple simulations if you build a good course wrap around them. So here are some of the other simulations that uh, we have used uh, in the training program. Uh, I try to expose analysts to the widest range of uh, joint maritime and naval kind of scenarios that they might uh, encounter uh, in, uh, in actual uh, career uh, analysis to give them uh, a broad base for pattern recognition and anomaly detection, the key to uh, intelligence and uh, uh, anticipatory uh, advisories uh, to authorities. So everything here from the Gerben chase, which was a classic sea chase in the First World War, uh, to uh, the Battle of Midway, um, and a number of other uh, scenarios uh, over the years. Uh, this is an illustration of one that they let us photograph in the Office of Naval Intelligence, where photography is controlled, um, uh, showing uh, the various different analysts in uh, a uh, execution of a game that was uh, in the Axis and Allies series. Uh, relatively simple, as you can see, we used plastic pieces without shame. Well, I started a little hesitant with plastic pieces, but it turned out it worked great. And I uh, kept the quantification manageable and the dynamics very, very active. So we got a lot of good debate and deliberation. So you can see the active level of participation, a simulation-based immersive experiential approach affords. The Navy, of course, has a very, very long history with uh, wargaming, uh, the Naval War College starting in the 1890s. And I'm sure all of you, if you're interested enough to be here tonight, have seen this famous quote from uh, Admiral Nimitz after the Second World War, hearkening back to his days at the War College and the experience of all the, uh, of virtually all the senior Naval uh, uh, admirals of the Second World War, uh, getting great value out of uh, wargaming to uh, prepare themselves uh, mentally and to prepare the Navy doctrinally and uh, with equipment and uh, programs uh, for the coming war. So the predictive power of the war gaming uh, was not quite as uh, strong as Nimitz said in a speech to the War College, um, because there are certain things that we weren't aware that we needed at that time, one of which is an active, willful Clausewitzian adversary to really challenge Blue uh, to think outside the box. We didn't have a strong enough Office of Naval Intelligence at that time to provide that kind of challenge. So we didn't quite shake up some of the foundations of uh, previous generational thinking in terms of battleships and gunnery and daylight combat rather than um, torpedoes, night action uh, with uh, uh, surface uh, units Although we did uh, very strongly uh, commit to aviation and uh, amphibious operations with the Marines. But uh, intelligence participation in wargaming is very, very important. And here's a, a war game uh, that uh, it is my ambition to run of uh, the uh, Second Fleet. Now that the Russians are coming, bringing themselves back into fashion, uh, this one of the, uh, the, the northern section of uh, the Norwegian Sea uh, might be highly relevant to today's problems for the Navy's perspective. 
So uh, what are the program objectives? It's not simply training in the military sense that you train individuals, you train the junior people. It's actually organizational learning. That's one of the reasons I diversify the training program so much is so we broaden the base of learning so that the entire organization starts thinking more militarily, starts thinking more uh, technically in terms of the kind of analytic approaches that the military takes uh, and the Navy participates in, in the military decision-making and military planning processes. So we, we do it with, with teams, with uh, something that in the intelligence community is called critical thinking and structured analysis or CTSA. And we're trying to institutionalize uh, this advanced analytic methodology. Uh, in addition, because it is immersive, it's dynamic, it really calls on individuals to participate, it helps to promote workforce morale and retention. It's just a bonding thing, and that's really good for the organization. We want them to build collaborative team spirit. We want them to have crosswalks across the various different stovepipes that organizations have and, uh, and stay with us for, for a long period of time. I, I frankly uh, sell that to, to management. Uh, but it's really to promote the analytic culture change and orientation toward both greater creativity and coming up with alternative hypotheses and challenging those with uh, simulated combat action where there are winners and losers and to get them to really have strong pattern recognition and anomaly detection so that they can think predictively and prepare themselves and the organization as a whole for potential uh, coming conflict. So that we have our usual documentary and regulatory basis the, the Office of the Director of National Intelligence has the intelligence community directives, and we have ONI directives, and so on and so forth. Uh, these are all part of the uh, basis for uh, establishment of any such program, and, and these are the ones we refer to here. So there's a strong um, basis for what is called analytic tradecraft uh, in the intelligence community, and we're trying to extend that into a higher order uh, mode of reasoning, to be perfectly honest. But also we have Simbat analysis, and that is for production uh, intelligence uh, and with using computational simulation modeling. That's all classified, so I'm not going to talk about it much here, but it is the co-equal um, uh, counterpart to the training. And the, the better we are in training with simulation, the better we'll be at analysis with simulation, the better we'll be with analysis and warning. So the methodology. The intelligence community uh, does not employ the same methodology that the Department of Defense and the military services employ. Even the components of the intelligence community that are part of the military, at least the civilian dominated uh, commands in uh, the continental United States was the Office of Naval Intelligence. I can't speak so much for the others, uh, which would be the National Ground Intelligence, National Air and Space Intelligence, so on and so forth. Uh, but typically, um, I see methodology as governed by the uh, Office of the Director of National Intelligence, kind of CIA, State Department, and it covers the full gamut of everything from political intelligence, social movements, and so on and so forth, and uh, does not quite go into the rigor and quantitative depth that military uh, analytic methods do when you have forces in the field or you have uh, joint uh, command and staff elements that are planning operations, executing operations, they ask a different sort of set of questions. So they're really very complementary. So what Simbat tries to do is build a bridge between these two. So th these two feature what I call paradigm complementarity in, in the sense of uh, uh, kind of the Zen or physics sense that one offers what the other doesn't and so on and so forth, kind of like a combined arms approach. So I see analytic tradecraft is it tends to be qualitative but it's strong on collaborative brainstorming, um, some open uh, imagination and uh, challenge techniques in a qualitative arena, and very good for the generation of alternative hypotheses. Whereas the Department of Defense, particularly say in uh, the earring in the Pentagon, where program decisions are made, you have these large suites of computer simulations that are very, very structured, um, and the, the creative dynamics are not quite as broad ranging as they are in the intelligence community for alternative hypotheses, because it's really quite a job to recode all of these gigantic simulations to run completely different hypotheses. Uh, so um, 
really the, the simplest way to say it is that the intelligence community is better at generating alternative hypotheses. Uh, the Department of Defense method is better th at analyzing them and testing them. So with that complementarity, we've got a kind of a learning spiral that we can generate. So you start with the design of an interdisciplinary team, you facilitate the brainstorming using critical thinking and structured analysis and intelligence community structured analytic techniques, which are very, very big, um, <coughs> excuse me, CIA, ODNI, so on and so forth. But then you get into the more scientific and rigorous modes. You start defining variables, variables that would be specific, uh, dependent in, independent variables in hypotheses, generate multiple alternative hypotheses. Now for production analysis, you would use computational modeling to test those alternative hypotheses. In the war game, we'll just run one war game and that's kind of the training course, that's the lab. And, and that tests their hypotheses. So red will have hypotheses and blue will have hypotheses. And then we will do an after action uh, analysis to, uh, to enable the analysts to rethink why they expected to see what they expected to see and what they learned, whether they, when they did or did not see what they had been forecasted. So again, uh, more images of uh, the, the low cost simulations that we use here. So one of the things that it's very important to develop is the basic kinds of uh, matrix oriented uh, structured analytic templates that are very military in their sense. So this one here, and I generate these on my own, sometimes borrow them from the military uh, decision-making process and military planning publications that have been out that services have done and the joint publications that the joint staff has gathered um, in the purple pubs. But it's very important for analysts to be able to correlate variables for um, uh, requirements and uh, solutions. So this one here, shows on the y-axis the various different kinds of uh, warfare operations that a Navy might do. In this case, this was for an historical war game. And the kinds of uh, assets that would be required in your forces and platforms in order to accomplish those missions. So it's a basic orientation towards a comprehensive rundown on roles and missions, which is a fundamental requirement for analysts to understand. So as, as I've hinted, the pedagogical philosophy is experiential active discovery learning. Combining both lecture and lab, we will have briefings on uh, uh, warfare in whatever era we're examining. And uh, students will very often give briefings as part of the, the training course. They're learning how to brief, a lot of learning objectives. Um, it's, it's conducted in a seminar uh, fashion. Uh, my task is to be Socratic, to teach through the interrogatory method, as it's called, the method of asking questions rather than telling, ask rather than tell, and then they'll experience and uh, having students speak and having students do is really how you embed the learning uh, in their memory and help habituate them to this approach to analysis. And it touches on a wide range of learning styles. You have the abstract versus the, the concrete learners, conceptual versus factual, theoretical versus experiential, Cognitive versus emotional, sensory, visual, I'm reading my slide here, but uh, this all sensory um, mode is really good for teams because individuals will find them kind of niching into certain activities where they're strong <laughs> when they collaboratively uh, assist each other in uh, coming up with multiple uh, hypotheses concerning adversary courses of actions that they expect to see and their own selection of a course of action based on that, including their force development. So again, uh, again, more strategic roles and missions. Uh, I very often touch in the classes on military theory, the principles of war, uh, not just roles and missions, but doctrine and operational art. So they'll really understand uh, the decision-making process of the senior authorities that we support and the decision-making processes of the senior authorities that we oppose and must understand. But the ultimate objective has been war preparedness. So we need to prepare the, the workforce for, uh, it's not the global war on terrorism anymore. Now it is a uh, great power uh, conflict. Uh, we're facing high technology, regional hegemons uh, that would pose very, very serious uh, threats to uh, world order, uh, the US position, US national security and the entire United States alliance. So we must prepare the workforce for this new threat level. So the structure and format of the courses. This program, SIMBAT, has been through its ups and downs 
uh, it was very strong during the era of intelligence reform um, after the, uh, uh, the 9 11 and the Iraqi weapons of mass destruction intelligence failure. But then things kind of eased off and it was ratcheted back to a training course um, that is just a few days. But the, the ideal is a three to five day duration, full blown program, very much on the Naval War College uh, level, uh, or not level, really. It's, uh, it's, a, it's a simplified microcosm of what the War College really does in a Title X uh, war game. But it's the same structure. It's kind of the same shape, but a, a, a micro version of it, which again will expose our analysts to participating in that kind of activity. We use the Naval War College uh, cell structure, the, the red cell for the adversary, the blue cell for friendly, and uh, the white cell for myself. Um, and when you have a full-blown course, it is a little bit labor intensive because you have folks running back and forth providing intelligence injects and inputs for the uh, through the various different teams when they issue their reconnaissance and intelligence collection orders, we in the white cell have to feed them the intelligence upon which they can make, make their decisions. So it's dirt cheap though in uh, the materials because of course the hobby war games, even though they're expensive for an individual to purchase nowadays, uh, they're dirt cheap compared to you know $500,000 for um, a, a software simulation that uh, would not necessarily be easy to manipulate and uh, adjust and adapt. It turns out that the manual wargaming with commercial products is really very flexible, very cheap, very easy to get going. It just requires you know expertise. You really have to have somebody who really understands uh, warfare modeling in order to implement the program. That's my job. So we started out with a plan for a curriculum and we, we made some progress in that. So what I'm sharing with you is a vision at this point in these slides. Um, but there was multiple tiers uh, to uh, run the students through a, a, uh, uh, a growing program of uh, depth and breadth of military expertise, including increasingly complicated simulation models to prepare them to be full-blown simulation-based analysts if we could get that methodology fully implemented. Now, we're not quite there yet, but um, I've always wanted to maintain this capability as a hip pocket reserve capability, because if we do go to war, we will need it and it will be called upon. I am quite confident. That's a personal opinion, but that's my bet. I hope I'll never learn whether it is or is not under such circumstances. So some bad courses. Um, there are some of the priority intelligence requirements That's they issue that to the white cell and the white cell must respond. Uh, one of the things that I also teach uh, in, in these courses is uh, a very strong concern that's important in the intelligence community with what are called cognitive heuristics and biases. You might have heard of these. I, I'm not sure if they're taught in college. I hope they are. <coughs> Pardon the cough. But uh, cognitive psychologists have come to learn that uh, most human beings um, suffer from certain tendencies toward cognitive error that actually could be uh, categorized and typified and named and classified. So we actually come up with some classifications of typical errors that people will make. Confirmation bias is a very common term nowadays. Uh, most people are familiar with it. Stereotyping has always been known. That's the one of prejudice. That's been called representativeness. Uh, projection, straight out of Freud. That's what we call in the intelligence community, mirror imaging. And there are other, other tendencies to uh, uh, anchor on previous knowledge and not adjust sufficiently to recognize changing data, a changing circumstance, uh, a habit of mind based on a comfort zone and the many repetitions of the same uh, belief, uh, not keeping up with rapidly changing threat uh, scenarios. And then there's the actor observer bias, failure to understand really why actors um, uh, act the way they do. Uh, if, you act, if you ask me, that's exactly what's going on in the, uh, the Putin-Biden issue that we see here, mutual incomprehension, inability to role play the other because of lack of simulation training, lifelong simulation training. And then there's bias blind spot, which uh, uh, the Russians are very good at. Uh, so uh, one of the courses that we run nowadays is in our introductory training program. Uh, that's called Cornerstone. That's a two-day program, relatively simple. Uh, but again, we use commercial uh, wargaming for that. 
I can go into this in greater depth, but I don't want to take your time too much here. Um, so uh, I have more information here on the tiers, but they're not fully implemented yet, so it's not worth delving too much into that. Let me get right into how we design a course. So uh, this is the intelligence and command problems that this is access and allies as it works. Uh, I've been able to uh, really hone analysts ability to do predictive analysis and the correlation between observed adversary capabilities and intended adversary or adversary intentions, relationship between capabilities and intentions. A good intelligence analyst should be able to infer from capabilities to intentions, why is the adversary building what he's building, or from intentions to capabilities, what can we expect him to build in the coming generation of acquisition? So I've touched on this. So how we structure the program, we start with a, a staff exercise. So we'll do a strategic net assessment. This is when I have the analysts set up the game. They set it up. We, I don't set it up. I want to familiarize them and give them that tactile kinesthetic sense of being engaged. So, and they know where all the forces are, where the, en where the enemy is. And then I'll, I'll have them do a kind of a net assessment with some very, very basic uh, specifics of counting forces, looking at the geography, understanding the maritime versus continental dimensions, and uh, some basic a net assessment um, that will uh, enable them to, to start doing a little bit of in-depth analysis. So that's basically orientation. In your OODA loop, that would be orientation. Uh, then uh, as part of this, these are the kinds of very, very simple questions that we ask. Um, it sounds a little bit um, juvenile, actually, I suppose, if you haven't seen it before. But when you have hundreds of pieces on a map all of which are, are of different kinds of forces, about a dozen different kinds of um, assets being depicted, uh, typically representing divisions or task forces. Um, it is uh, not at all obvious to the analysts and just having them take the time to go through all of the uh, assets there and, and count them up and, and get a, a basic set of the st strategic threat environment um, is, is very, very useful. And then I can bring in the concepts here of center of gravity and critical vulnerability. Usually, first off, the analysts aren't really ready to answer those questions. So I'm just kind of putting a little uh, uh, seed in their mind to think about that as they proceed in their decision making. Then we do the intelligence exercise. So we have them uh, engage in um, uh, a red hat exercise where they, they red will role play blue, blue will role play, play red, and try to think what the other guy is going to do. And here's where we do the alternative courses of action. So we um, uh, enable, enable them to generate several different hypotheses and they'll debate over these hypotheses internally among themselves. And then they'll jot down at least two. Uh, usually I try to ask them to do the standard, most likely, most dangerous. They record that in notes for um, the after action review when we'll uh, uh, ask, why they ex expected that and uh, what the, uh, the actual adversary was thinking. And of course, these are all students. Uh, and we'll go through what kind of uh, INW indicators would be associated with uh, various different um, uh, alternative courses of action. And this is where I'm teaching them about, well, armor is an offensive asset, it's expensive. Infantry is a defensive asset, by and large. It's, it's inexpensive. What about maritime? What is offensive maritime? And, and typically that's aircraft carriers, battleships, so on and so forth. And I'm trying to have them reason through the various different uh, attributes of the combat forces so they can come up with a general picture of what the enemy is likely to do. And then we really get into the, the staff exercise where they come up with their own course of action. They, they formulate their op plan. And uh, so we do that in the, the five paragraph op board SMIAC format. Um, with just the basic drill of, of the, the planning uh, process that uh, the Department of Defense and the services uh, employ. But of course, here, instead of being 100 pages of uh, uh, detailed planning, it's just what the students could put together uh, in a morning or afternoon. And SMEAC stands for Situation Mission Enemy Administration Logistics and Command and Control, with a real fo focus for our coursework on uh, Situation Mission and Enemy, at least at the junior level with the simpler simulations. 
And then we have the lessons learned after action review, which is always a, a mandatory uh, part of any, um, really a learning course, any and all experiential learning, uh, because the experiential learning is so dynamic, it's, it's actually emotional because there is kind of prestige on the line. It's, it, it takes the students to something called the uh, zone of proximal development. It stresses their ability to learn, to memorize, to think and decide and make a winning plan. And, but just enough to get them on their toes, not so much that they cannot master it. Of course, and it's my job then to provide the coaching and mentoring to help answer questions so that they can uh, succeed and that all students in the uh, group uh, can be assured uh, a voice and an opportunity to participate and learn. So that is basically uh, the gist of the program. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, the Office of Naval Intelligence will expand it uh, in the coming uh, months. Uh, the current situation is that um, I am one of several analytic facilitators in a new position that ONI has created. Um, and that might provide the opportunity to uh, uh, and put, position me to, to uh, pitch this program and renew it because it, it was done. We ran about a dozen courses uh, in the early to mid years of the program and uh, several um, computational uh, production analysis uh, projects, which uh, resulted in the production of products, analytic products, and um, uh, briefings and, and written reports. And uh, so my intent is to, to bring this to fruition and uh, and, and improve the quality of the work and prepare us for war. So I guess, Seb, I should have stopped um, to uh, provide an opportunity for questions. Uh, we've now reached the end and uh, I, I meant to do so, but I was just blithering on. And uh, are there any questions now? Hey, Tim, we have a couple questions. Uh, I'll try to go then in order. Uh, in terms of your use of commercial games, I believe this was in reference to the fleet series. Do you or uh, do you update the order of battle or stay it historical as is designed in the game? It depends on what we're doing. Um, my intent is to take the fleet series and update it with contemporary current. Um, that's really going to be a uh, that's almost a bridge between training and analysis. It's really analyst familiarization with the current contemporary threat. One of the things I do with the historical analysis is um, I, I step it back from the current. So they're, they're, the analysts are less focused on production and the demands and kind of think it's, it's less training, more education. And they can start thinking about fundamentals and, and broaden their reasoning mode. So I actually try to layer um, different levels of uh, intensity. So a, a lot of these have been straight historical. I mean, you can see Axis and Allies, those are World War II. World War II is very good because it was a huge maritime fight um, and it was joint. All the fundamental joint elements are there, really, really good for junior analysts. And a lot of this has been for junior analysts. Moving up in the higher tiers that I made reference to, yes, that means we're going to go toward um, updated order of battle. That itself, however, is a design challenge because quantifying the combat capabilities on the unit factors uh, for uh, missile, well, you, you know better than anybody said, so, um, uh, quantifying the combat capabilities is, is quite a challenge. And in fact, that's an intelligence assessment. Even if it's highly abstract in a sense that analysts in the intelligence community are not used to, they think of it, you know, in terms of what are the specific characteristics and performance of the weapon system. But if you're taking this at the operational level and you're reducing everything to a single datum, um, that's a, a mode of reasoning that's challenging. Uh, and that would be an intelligence production effort. So I haven't been able to do that because that, that almost would require a lab and a lot of analysts really willing to delve into the concept of modeling. So one of the things we're doing where I work now in the Farragut Technical Analysis Center is uh, in the modeling and simulation department. And we're trying to build a culture of modeling and simulation so that the workforce can uh, better understand how you can quantitatively represent uh, forces and capabilities at a, at a higher order of abstraction so you can actually do modeling and simulation at the campaign modeling level. So that, that would really be like designing a campaign model. Over. 
So another question is, um, you mentioned various commercial games that you use. Uh, there was a slide with a bunch of different photos. Uh, for those who don't recognize them off the images, what other games do you use for your Simbat Educational Wargaming program? Well, at this point, it's become quite a few. I started out actually with uh, what broadly come out of the, what are the category of uh, quote unquote hex and counter uh, war games, which are quantitatively dense with large rule sets. And I quickly found that that was not meeting the accessibility requirements of the junior workforce. I was reaching too far. I didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, you, it's always the thing in war gaming, well, it's a game or they're just playing a game. So you want to make it as rigorous as possible so that you can show that it's really analytic work. Uh, but it turns out that if you want to bring junior people into it, you really have to um, hit fundamentals at, 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 at a targeted level of simplicity. And the whole series of games of Axis and Allies, if given certain modifications, so you have to modify the, the rule set, but you take that core of simplicity and uh, the, the data schema that the Axis and Allies series uh, works with. And it turns out that that has really uh, been very, very effective at the junior level. Let me go through some of the other photographs. So this game is uh, the Gerben Chase. You'll see the Mediterranean on the right there. Uh, one of the things that we do in maritime intelligence is we track shipments and uh, uh, illicit shipments, threats, you know, that uh, for uh, proliferation, so on and so forth. It's part of our advisory support to uh, global policy. And uh, so the sea chase is a classic intelligence problem. And uh, so uh, cruisers in the First World War, there were the cruisers and raiders, even the, the submarine pub, we've had submarine war games. The hunting and searching um, is a classic intelligence problem. So we've had a game that, that brings that out and uh, touches on that learning objective. This game is a Guadalcanal game in the Axis and Allies series. This enabled me to bring in uh, task force design. So task force design is, is very, very important. Uh, there, there have been some games we have run where analysts stripped their high value assets, which would be the carriers and the battleships, of uh, escorts, cruisers and destroyers, and they just barged forth. And these were not junior analysts. As a matter of fact, these were not civilians. And uh, they, were, they were bounced. Uh, they, they went, well, it was a Pacific War in World War II. They went from the uh, uh, the Marshall Islands, Marshalls and Gilberts, they said, well, that was easy enough. Let's continue on to the Carolines. And they went to the Carolines where the Japanese had their fleet base in Truk, which is where it historically was. And uh, they were trounced. And so the learning the importance of escorting high value assets is something that does not necessarily come intuitively, um, even to analysts who um, are, you know, have some reason about of military knowledge. It's one thing to understand at the, you know, junior officer level, your assigned duties aboard ship in the squadron. A lot of those are engineering duties, in fact, in a sense. I mean, you know, you're, you're, you'll be conning the ship, but you, you might be in an engineering department. Uh, you don't have an admiral's perspective. Well, we in the intelligence community have to have an admiral's perspective. No matter how junior our analysts are, we're analyzing the behavior of adversary admirals in support of, of blue admirals, and we must understand the operational level of war. So these kinds of basic force allocations um, can be brought up beautifully in these kinds of games, because these are universals. They, they've been problems in warfare since time immemorial. So uh, in the lower right here, we have the Battle of Midway, a classic search, but also um, a, a much more detailed, this was a fairly detailed one, not for juniors. Um, and so they had to really understand force structure, the um, carrier operations, um, actually planning out flight routes, um, searching for uh, adversary task forces and uh, establishing their anti-air warfare screens and so on and so forth. So that was actually pretty tactical. We were getting them right into the nitty gritty there. Um, uh, the other one to the upper left here is the Battle of Britain. That's on my to-do list. Um, the units up top are some of the uh, unit counters from a Jutland game that we, we ran. And I'm, I'm just flipping through some of the photographs now that we have a few minutes to discuss them. Now, I'd love to do this with Second Fleet. You recognize the fleet series immediately. Um, uh, this would have training value even if we did it back in the 1980s, because in fact, at that time, 
the Soviets had a, a larger navy than they do today with a somewhat different mission. Um, it was a major oceanic threat, a massive submarine threat. Uh, there would be good training value in, in looking at that and, and having that kind of background knowledge uh, in the knowledge base of our analytic cadre. That should be part of the organizational memory of the Office of Naval Intelligence. That was how the Office of Naval Intelligence contributed to the, uh, the maritime strategy of uh, the Reagan era um, that was so instrumental in uh, rushing the uh, Soviets into uh, collapse. This one is the Pacific War. Um, uh, and this one enabled me to bring a tremendous amount of logistics into it. So we would uh, put together task forces and they would have to oil up and ammo up. And if they consumed their ammo uh, and fuel, they would um, have to return to base. So all operations had to be planned around a logistics cycle. So that was one of the main uh, emphases here. Uh, that and of course, as always, the, the mix of forces, the high-low mix, high value assets, offense versus defense, cost effectiveness, because in access knowledge, you do your own force design. It's very interesting. There are a lot of um, hex encounter games that are quite popular um, and, and very rules dense. There's one called, say, Total or Krieg, for instance, that's very, very popular. I even had a book written about it. Um, and uh, in it, you don't, you don't design your forces. You, if you make an acquisition, you'll buy an army or an army group you'll buy an air force, you'll buy a fleet. And that was true in, in Third Reich, another very famous uh, hex encounter game at the strategic level of World War II. In Axis and Allies, you'll build aircraft carriers, battleships, cruisers, destroyers, submarines, transports, armor, infantry, artillery, um, and uh, strategic and tactical air power, um, and even medium bombers. So you will actually have to align your programming along a POM, a program objective memorandum with the resources that you, you, you get. So you actually do force design just like the Department of Defense does in the defense budget, in, in force structuring. So Access Analysis is one of the only games out there that requires you to design your force right down to the nitty gritty. And then you have to integrate. You have to make sure that you have your, your right number of assets in your task forces to perform the mission to which you assign them. So you might have your core element going in with your amphibs and there are transports in it, so there is lift. So you'll have your, your main carrier uh, and battleship force uh, going there, but you might have screening forces uh, left and right, so on and so forth to perform um, our reconnaissance missions because when we do the full blown Simbat, we're in two different rooms, uh, white cells running back and forth like uh, analysts with the heads cut off. Um, but in order to, for the blue cell to depict red on the blue cell chart, uh, they have to get an intelligence report and we give them the intelligence report and that's their best estimate. And that's why you can blunder into enemy forces if you move beyond the radius of the reconnaissance that you had previously ordered or that the white cell had been able to uh, supply. So all of these learning dynamics occur um, when you are simulating actual warfare, even at the simplest level of resolution. So if you focus on the course design and the fundamentals and underlying concepts of warfare, um, these simple simulations are really the best. You, you don't lose the forest for the trees. You really focus on the forest, <coughs> which is perfect for junior analysts. And this would be great in today's um, security studies world. It's a perfect thing for security studies where many new um, uh, folks are taking a, a, an interest in national security affairs uh, with, with diversity and inclusion. Uh, they're coming in, first look at the, the problem. This is a great way to get fundamentals really fast in a very enjoyable and, and very dynamic way that is highly memorable. So, um, so this might be a retirement uh, career for me here as well um, after uh, resurrecting here at, at uh, at ONI. Over. Hey, Tim, I have a couple other questions. Uh, when using historical war games or simulations, how much do you believe preconceptions, uh, paradigms, and previous knowledge of conflict shapes the decisions and learning of the students? Not much. Not much. They're too junior. Uh, some, some are. Some have, have some knowledge, but it's quite um, 
uh, impressive how little knowledge they really bring to bear. So they don't bring much in the way of biases. Um, I think Rommel was asked in 1943, uh, which army was the greater uh, danger, the British army or the American army when Rommel was fighting in North Africa. Uh, and he said uh, uh, the American army because they have less to unlearn uh, in their process of learning than the British did because the British were wedded to a lot of obsolete notions of warfare, whereas the Americans were very open-minded because uh, we hadn't had the in ingrained experience of the First World War quite to the same degree. And so we were very open-minded and willing to learn. So the analysts are very open-minded and willing to learn, but they don't bring uh, much in the way of preconceived notions and they might not even be familiar really with the events being depicted so it really makes it easy you can get away with a lot you know you can do a midway and they won't really um understand that uh you know that the uh the fact that the americans have the carriers there um you know the the, the same way that the, the uh it's it uh, i'm, I'm blundering but midway is, is hard to simulate because well now the japanese know the americans know so, you know, you really can never get a midway like result in a simulation with the analysts coming in with that background knowledge. But if they don't really have that background knowledge, uh, they might not know how to take advantage of um, the order of battle anyhow. So it doesn't really get much in the way. This is truly um, first tier uh, military exposure from the, the majority of our analysts. Over. When using a commercial system such as Fleet Series and possibly others like Next War, how do you address the learning curve in regards to the rules? Well, the rule is that they don't read rules. Now, sometimes they want to. So actually, I, I left them. There's always a, a leader or two in one of the cells who will want to read rules. But I don't demand that. Uh, that's my job. So that's one of the reasons we choose access now is because it's really easy to convey. It's pretty much semi-intuitive there. Um, and there aren't a whole lot of if this, then that, if that, then this kinds of exceptions of uh, the nitty gritty that you have to get into with hex and counter war gaming. Uh, so uh, as the analysts grow, and if we can get this tiered uh, curriculum um, prepared, um, and there has been some movement in that direction, it's just fitful. Um, then we will build on core knowledge and, and the analysts will rap rapidly ramp up to more complex uh, models, simulation models is what these war games are, and uh, and then do much more technical analysis to understand the war game. And we'll expect them to come to understand the rules of war game, because understanding the rules of war game is understanding the model of war. And understanding a model of, of war is understanding the theory of war, and understanding the theory of war is, is understanding warfare. So really, war gaming is, is in addition to reading your history and having the technical manuals of fleet order of battle and uh, an army order of battle and uh, characteristics and performance of weapon system. These, this is a, a core requirement. You have to have an active dimension in your learning. You can't just be a sit down and read uh, student of military affairs to really understand it. You must experiment with alternative uh, mixes uh, in what you are learning in terms of capabilities and COAs, over. To sort of follow up on this, uh, that question, uh, I want to ask one of the more recent question is, do you focus mainly on perfect knowledge games or are there elements of hidden knowledge or imperfect information? In the junior game, the most junior one, uh, that was, I mentioned Cornerstone, that's our introductory course, it's just a couple of days. We might be able to move it to three days. Um, and all this, by the way, has been uh, impeded by COVID because it's really a face-to-face. -face. It's an interpersonal thing. It's a, it's a personality dynamic. That's all part of the kind of bonding and the social nature of, of, of building this organization as a learning organization. Um, it, it doesn't work very well online. That impersonal distance breaks down a lot of the, uh, the conveyance of information and, and, and the teaming and uh, dynamics. But uh, so in the junior one, the most junior one, it's a perfect knowledge game. Uh, it, but it's compensated by not being a perfect understanding game. So that one, they, they, red will leave and blue will deliberate. Blue will leave and red will come in and deliberate. But then the, the war game, they'll experiment it out together. And everybody will be in the room, but a huge gaggle. Um, it, it gets a little bit noisy. Um, and, uh, 
and, and die rolling, I can tell you nothing engages people more than die rolling. It just doesn't change because they care. And, and getting that care is how you get that learning and how you get that uh, retention. In the mid-tier games, we have the red cell, blue cell separated in different rooms. That's kind of hard to organize. You really need a room structure to do that. And most organizations, they, they don't really do a kind of a lab-oriented approach to analysis. They really do a sit and read and write approach to analysis. Very different. You need a lab. So you need two different rooms. But most of the uh, games where I've been describing um, these specific games and so on and so forth, those are in two different rooms where blue must call out an intelligence collection and reconnaissance plan and give that to white. And then red will do the same thing. And white will run back and forth and give an intelligence feed uh, in response to um, various different requests for intelligence. Usually we simplify that by just making it a reconnaissance plan um, because it's just very labor intensive to get into a full blown, well, are we gonna do cryptology? Are we gonna do magic and ultra? Um, are we going to do um, HFDF, so on and so forth? So we kind of do a reconnaissance uh, based on, on their uh, expressed areas of interest. And, uh, and they'll, they'll put those reconnaissance assets, a typical aerial reconnaissance, and that is our surrogate for a more complex uh, intelligence plan that could be more um, easy to implement in, in a more sophisticated simulation where we take more time and uh, or a computational simulation where it's easier to have limited intelligence. But yeah, so, so the answer to your question is we do it both ways, but the mid-tier um, is intended to be two different rooms and the analysts have to have a commander and a, and, a, and a J2. They have to have a commander, a J3 and a J2. So you actually have a J2 function. Um, <clears throat> we'll typically have, the largest I ever had was 19 between two different uh, cells plus about five, which was the largest white cell I ever had. And uh, typically about a, a dozen to 15 will be about the max we can reasonably do. But that enables you to have a complete hierarchical staff structure. So you'll have <clears throat> a commander and you will have uh, a uh, ops and intel. <clears throat> and uh, then you'll have local force commanders. And uh, for instance, in Axis and Allies, you might have, you know, the Germans be one, the Italians be one, the uh, so on, and the, the British, they'll have a player in the East and a player in, in Europe. Uh, the Americans have a player in the Pacific and a player in the Atlantic in Europe, so on and so forth. Um, so we'll have that full staff structure. Um, and, uh, and that's true even in the uh, perfect knowledge game, um, but especially in the larger, more robust, longer and, and higher order learning games, at, at the middle tier, over. So another question is, are these courses and games run online? If not, can they be made to run exclusively online or cross-regional collaboration? And how would you go about that? You addressed a little bit of it, mentioning COVID protocols, but could you elaborate on that? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, <clears throat> I ran a course. Um, for ONI, um, employing Simbat online. Um, that was with Microsoft Teams. And it, it really, it proved problematic. Uh, most of the analysts would, uh, the students would, uh, you know, blank out their, their video feed and they'd mute, mute their, you know, bikes, um, which is an impediment to communication right there. But I, I had no visual sense of the participation. I couldn't do the Socratic method really very effectively because I would ask questions and just get silence. Even if they wanted to answer, they would fiddle with the mute, so on and so forth. Um, it really is very difficult to do high intensity collaboration in a tight time frame online. So if it were to be done online, you would almost have to have it primarily not verbal or oral, but written. You would have to have a chat function, which works fine. I mean, you can do that. Uh, and you would really have to take time. So it couldn't be, it would be very difficult to make it a two day program because the deceleration of communication online, uh, at least at current levels of familiarity and habituation. I could imagine a future scenario where we're all so familiar and so comfortable with doing it online verbally that we kind of uh, 
amped up our chops and, and really got good at it. But it was quite uh, fitful and, uh, and, and incomplete and, and, and really dissatisfying, um, particularly for the, the, the uh, particularly for the instructor. Um, I, I, I empathize strongly with him. Um, but it's very, very hard. You really have to read your people um, if you want to run a course like this. This is a, a personality. It's choreography. It's, 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 it's dance on stage. And uh, it, it's a choral, you know, um, stimulus and response and very verbal. So to get that level of intensity, you, you'd have to shift, I think, to a written mode, and then you can have chat function, and then you'd start with using things like Discord and uh, Vassal, um, just like you do, um, Seb, with your, your FMF scenario. And, and that might work well. I would have to get better at it myself. I think uh, you might get more active participation just because of interest level. Sometimes students get dragged into a course. You can stimulate them and enthuse them once they're actively engaged in it, and they're kind of stuck. But if they can retreat behind their uh, blank wall of that little circle on the screen where they um, blank out their video, a lot of analysts will do that. And it's really, really hard to um, elicit the full level of participation. So, and it could have been my own skills. So, so my experience with that was uh, dissatisfying, but my experience with Vassal and Discord uh, with FMF with you was pretty good. So I guess it can be done <laughs> if you have the right guy doing it anyhow. Over. So on the note of online facilitation, it, I, I've definitely learned through running FMF that it requires a different type of facilitation style and skill set that you just have to get good at. Um, personally and jokingly, I say heckling usually works. I usually yeah. heckle my players to, into uh, being engaged and um, being involved and being, you know, making more casual and conversational and less of a like, do you know the answer to the test sort of answer, but Moving on to the next question. How do you see this program being potentially applied uh, through the IC or throughout the fleet in terms of the Navy? Well, uh, I don't know about the fleet, but in terms of the IC, the idea would be, and this is a vision, and, and I actually, it's oddly enough, there's something in the intelligence community known as the Galileo Awards. It's just an essay contest. So I, I won one uh, one year, uh, some years back, during the uh, high intensity years of intelligence uh, reform with the uh, blue ribbon panels on Congress and the uh, the, the act to, to improve the uh, act of congressional legislation to improve intelligence and create the office of the director of national intelligence, when things were all hot and heavy for reform and new ideas and and actual tolerance of change, or at least you know uh, uh, some tolerance of change, um, we were. Uh, uh, I wrote this this essay proposing that we need lab-based intelligence. We need to start having lab-based, both for computational simulation modeling, campaign analysis. We need to mirror what the Department of Defense does and, and stop being so discursive, qualitative, and, and uh, literary in our approach. Uh, writing is not analysis. It is not synonymous with analysis. It doesn't produce analysis. You need challenge and response. You need interaction. You need dynamics. You need the clash of hypotheses with data. You need the clash of theory and data. You don't get a clash of theory and data in a single mind. You get a clash of theory and data with brainstorming, with interdisciplinary collaboration, and with testing your hypotheses um, in the field of battle. And, you know, what uh, E.O. Wilson calls the acid bath of experimentation. And that's what uh, Wargaming does. It, and that's what the Naval War College has always done. So, um, uh, you know, with Wargaming, you, that, that led us through World War II. So I, I proposed that in the IC and it was, it got polite applause, but nothing has been done, done with it. The Office of the Director of National Intelligence even established a simulation center, but it got no traction. Culture change is really, really hard in peacetime bureaucratic organizations. But if we keep this capability, this iron in the fire, this option in the hip pocket, there's a possibility that we could move out smartly uh, with if, if, you know, all hell breaks out. Over. On a side note, do you know what happened to that simulation center? It just died. It, I, I just don't, I don't, I don't know if it was ever used. It was an ODNI thing. Um, it, it, 
window dressing, you know. Uh, it, it just never went anywhere. So you can go into the websites where we, we, we look at things uh, and, uh, and you can see the last time anything was posted to the, um, the website. And I just don't see any reports. There, there have been some talk about it. And there are there is some simulation activity um, and war game activity uh, in the community, um, which is good. That's a great sign. Um, and uh, I would love to collaborate. That would help uh, build it. So it, it's not dead. It's, it's just somewhat dormant. Um, but the pressure now that everybody is feeling uh, of threat, of real threat, um, opens the potential uh, acceptability um, gate for these kinds of innovative departures. So hope springs eternal, no matter how old I get. And uh, we'll have to see what happens. Over. So one of the question is, will you post or have you posted any of the downloadable and editable files that you mentioned, like the ones you use in terms of access and allies and the, the, the forms you uh, shown on your screen? Uh, I have not done it online. Um, that's interesting. You know, the this this act, I mean, I've briefed this brief many times, so th this is uncontroversial. Um, connections and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but actually posting it, that's that's. That's a pretty interesting idea. I, I would have to, of course, you always have to get permission to do these things in the intelligence community if it's a departure. But with the book that you're editing, um, that uh, chapter um, includes a lot of this, and it will include those sections, particularly if the appendix winds up in the, uh, the appendix is where I kind of showed all these things. We'll see, I have to see how you and uh, Mark or you want to uh, uh, present it, but that would be the first go ahead. And uh, if there were a demand signal, um, within the broader national security uh, institution, uh, I would certainly want to uh, uh, run it up the flagpole and see if I couldn't make a favorable response to sharing this material. It's totally unclassified. I mean, it's, it's access and allies. You know, it's roles and missions. It's just totally unclassified. Thank um, you for reminding me about our edited volume that I still have to work on. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so on a similar vein, um, are any of your modified versions uh, of these game rules like access and allies, you, you mentioned you adapted fuel and uh, ammunition rules to it, are they available anywhere or will you also consider making them available? Well, I'll, I'll just give them, I mean, they're, they're totally unclassified. Um, I did them at home um, just because I'm a war game geek, right? Um, so I, I love war, war military analysis, I live and eat and breathe it. Um, and I actually had like main, main jobs at work. This has all been a collateral duty. So, um, and then I would present it, of course, I do it on duty time uh, for actually executing the course, but most of the design work was done at home anyhow. So um, I can share that. Um, I would inform the chain of command, um, but I would share it um, willingly and uh, demo a course and help anybody run a course the courses are hard to run. I mean, you really have to, well, as you know, you have to have a knack. You have to understand the simulation. But access and knowledge is a lot easier to understand than FMF. I can assure you that. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, FMF has its own sort of uh, struggles in terms of uh, running it and facilitating it. But are you concerned about your approach in terms of Simbat promotes mirroring, uh, mirroring uh, in the players uh, in terms of the analysts? Like, for example, China has carriers, but they may not think about them or use them as the same way as the U.S. Ware of War. Well, that's where the alternative uh, brainstorming comes in and the interdisciplinary um, <clears throat> team uh, collaboration. The ideal team is, is an interagency interdisciplinary, uh, interdepartmental team. So you, if you would have the Paul Mill and, and the culture folks um, taking a look at it um, and our operations and, and tactics guys who know not to mirror image because they understand the culture, Chinese strategic culture, a lot of work has been done on that. The strategic drivers of uh, Chinese decision-making <clears throat> which will force a different kind of uh, uh, force management and operational execution than we would typically implement 
because of our strategic situation. So that's a big learning objective to understand those differences. And by bringing the, the culture folks in, the ops tactics guys who watch the exercises, the folks who read the doctrine um, and, uh, and, and go through the, 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 the publications um, from the war colleges and, and so on and so forth that uh, are available um, and, uh, and, and, and other sources on uh, these kinds of cultures, doctrines and behaviors, um, it enables us to uh, confront those distinctions and open our minds to the awareness of difference. That's critical. I'm glad you mentioned that, Seb, because it's critical to prevent surprise. Mirror imaging is, is a trap one can easily get into. And, uh, you know, I've, I've just been doing, just, as, just an aside, if I can take a few minutes. Now, there's a board war game called <clears throat> Empire of the Sun, and it's about the uh, Pacific campaign of World War II. And I'm doing the introductory scenario, which is 1942-43 in the Solomons. And I've just been rereading about the United States Navy and the surface actions um, at nighttime. And we, I, I mentioned this earlier on. Mirror imaging was what I was getting at when I talked about the United States Navy was a, a black shoe Navy, a gunnery Navy, and that meant a daytime Navy. The Japanese had made a fundamental transition. They weren't wedded to the, uh, <clears throat> the deck plates of, of, of the, the gunnery fleet to the ex same extent that the United States Navy was. They introduced very sophisticated torpedoes and going with torpedoes, they realized we need a different tactical mode. We need to get close because these things are hugely expensive, hugely lethal, but you can't redirect them once you've launched them. So it's not that you can't redirect your fire once you've launched them. Once you've launched them, you've shot your wad to a certain extent. And so they would get in close. The only way you get in close is at night. So they went to night surface actions in the Solomon's campaign, took us totally by surprise. We had mirror imaged. We didn't mirror image at the strategic level. There we understood what the Japanese were going to do. Different people were running the strategic game. They call it the strategic chart exercise at the Naval War College. And, and different people were running the tactical game, which was more part of the educational part rather than the kind of simulation laboratory. So there's some really good books on this subject. If you're interested in, in the Naval War College and the history of wargaming, Peter Pearl is The Art of Wargaming, very, very good book, touches on it extensively. It's the, the first place I would start. A very famous technical analyst by the name of Norman Friedman has written a book called um, Winning Future Wars, and it's about the Naval War College gaming and, and how the lessons were learned uh, from that and incorporated into the, the redesign of the fleet and the modernization of the fleet to prepare it for the Second World War. And, uh, and then a, a big, very deep uh, analytic research work uh, by uh, Edward Miller called War Plan Orange, which entire, it covers the entire history of United States Navy op planning with Plan Orange, the Rainbow Plan, and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. That basically was the precursor of the uh, the grand strategic move across the Pacific uh, in, in World War II. Moltke once famously observed, the, the German general who was so big on wargaming uh, in the Prussian general staff and the later uh, integrated German general staff, that uh, no plan survives contact with the enemy. Well, I don't, I don't really know why he said that because most of his plans did. Um, and certainly at the United States Navy's strategic level, uh, we understood Japanese culture, doctrine and requirements well enough to um, outmatch them uh, conceptually in preparing for the war well in advance. But we didn't do it at the tactical level um, uh, with uh, cruiser destroyer surface forces. So that just shows the importance of exactly what you're saying about mirror imaging. And that's, that goes to those issues of uh, confirmation bias, projection, uh, and stereotyping th that we, um, that I mentioned earlier that are part of the cognitive heuristics and biases that simplify our uh, ability to understand the, the vast welfare of data that comes into our, our eyes and brains in the course of our days and lives, but can set up traps for us if we don't know when to step back and say, wait a minute, there's an anomaly here. So that's the key. You need not just pattern recognition, which can lead to habituated modes of reading, reasoning. You need anomaly detection, the inverse of that. You need to be able to see when things change. And you need to be able to see when there are things that don't fit and you just want to ignore them and say, oh, well, I don't know why that fits, but I got the general picture. Um, you have to sometimes look at the, the uh, 
the whispers of signal and the whispers of indicators and the uncertain indicators and the ambiguous indicators in intelligence to understand that there's actually something behind that. There is uh, an iceberg of truth hidden behind that little uh, peak of ice that you see sticking out over the, the seascape of normality, if you will, over. So the next question says, since most of the future great war power conflicts uh, that these O&I analysts will need to support will be wars between nuclear capable states, how do you factor that dy dynamic into games that examine World War I or World War II era war games? Well, <clears throat> well, we don't. Because um, uh, we, we, we've gone mostly at the operational level of war. Uh, at the strategic level of war, um, I mean, we, actually, the simple game we do is strategic, but we don't we don't go nuclear with that at all. Um, and that's a very very hard thing to calculate in, and that I think would better be handled by a specialized simulation model that focused on grand strategic decision making and really uh, eliminated all of the trees and focused on the forest and and really pitched the whole scenario at the national command authority level, rather than at the theater joint level uh, or the task force uh, and operational art level where I've done so far. So that, um, that's truly uh, Title 10, but that would also be really good. I mean, that's the kind of thing we should do um, at, at ODNI. That's the kind of thing that should be done um, at the NIC, um, at the National Intelligence Council and uh, the NIC level. Um, that's that's a higher level of uh, concern than we and O and I typically look at, where we're focused so much at the oceanic and fleet uh, operational and tactical levels of war. Over. So the next question says, um, one of the tricky bits for commercial uh, games is the modeling of the gray zone or uh, asymmetric warfare. How do you approach this in some of the games you use? Oh, we directly include uh, it. Now, I'm not sure what you mean by asymmetric warfare. That has many different meanings to asymmetric warfare. Um, in maneuver warfare, the concept of asymmetry can involve conventional versus conventional forces, but maneuver to create an asymmetry of momentum or force capability geographically, temporally, or technologically that, um, that will win a high technology warfare. For instance, so the, the Chinese uh, anti-ship ballistic missiles, that's a classic asymmetric threat. But the word asymmetric warfare is very often taken to imply a, a counterinsurgency or a, uh, um, a, a guerrilla uh, social terrorism sort of uh, activity. And, and I can tell you that uh, you can get the USS Cole with a terrorist act, but the Navy does not directly deal in the global war on terror sort of problem area, which is more of a theater commander um, and special forces. Uh, the Marines obviously had to do that. So the forces that really looked at that over the past 10 years were the Army and the Marine Corps <clears throat> and the CIA, of course. And uh, so the Navy would support that, but we weren't in the mix with the counterinsurgency operations, the, the uh, socio-cultural uh, uh, human terrain, as the Army called it, um, and, uh, and, and so forth. So what we focus in on is uh, high technology warfare, predominantly at sea or from the sea uh, to shore with the strike aviation and the landing of uh, landing forces. And, and that's been our focus. So we have not, we don't go into uh, um, asymmetric warfare in, in the sense of counterinsurgency. It's really not central to our uh, uh, mission area in, in the Navy in general and the Office of Naval Intelligence in particular. Over. So another question is, how do you factor in the political dimension of these conflicts into these simulations if you do so at all? We don't. That, that's another, that's, that's, it is itself an asymmetry. Again, that's more the national command level. So we build in the war. The war is going to happen. There's no choice. No, you can't rearrange your alliance. I've had that Germans say, well, can I form an alliance with the Soviets here? 
No, you can't. This is a war game. It's a military game because we have military training objectives, which are all aligned to the military decision making process, the military planning process, uh, critical factors analysis, which is critical capabilities and critical vulnerabilities, and uh, and so on and so forth. We have a straight military perspective. So it, it's, not, it's not risk, it's not a Paul Mill game. If I were working at the State Department though, uh, there are a lot of games where we could have shifting alliances, uh, go to war, not go to war. Um, but um, as, as Henry Stimson, uh, FDR's uh, uh, Secretary of War said, uh, prior to the Second World War, just when uh, we knew that the Japanese were about to strike into Southeast Asia, and commence a war with the, the British, the Dutch, and ourselves. He said, I washed my hands of the problem. It's now up to the Army and the Navy. And uh, so we take over there. So that's what I do in, in the War Game Training Program. Take over there. The war has been thrust upon us. Now we must figure it out. Over. So on the topic of analyst training, how do you prepare an analyst to do a credible job of game analysis? For example, the analyst must have a co uh, coherent idea of what to look for and why being the thrust into itself into the game. Well, that is, I mean, that I think is the beauty of Simbat, that we can get under the radar organizationally and not take too much time away from actual production. Um, and yet, nonetheless, by using this immersive method and this, this war game that presents so much data so quickly, we almost give them a gestalt. We, we start, we, we run the, the program through that basic orientation to the problem, the basic orientation to the game, the basic orientation to forces, roles, missions, capabilities, intentions, basic orientation to structured templates. They're filling out these templates. And as they fill out these, these uh, synchronization templates and these, these military decision-making uh, structured analytic uh, worksheets, if you will, which are really what they are, the worksheets. Um, they, they learn how you ask these kinds of questions and how you address these kinds of questions. So they'll go to the game board and they'll say, oh, okay, well, if this, then that, then they'll get it. So it all comes in. There's, you give them a, a stepwise approach to immersion into the game um, so that they're not uh, gobsmacked by the initial complexity. Um, and you just have them pick it apart step by step by step by asking them strategic questions. Uh, the concept of you know, strategic, operational, tactical questions, some selected questions that get them one step, then the next step, the next step into the inferential reasoning from the, the data that they're seeing, they're physically seeing and observing on the board. So, um, by the end of the course, they've had an exposure. Now, they're not masters, but that's the idea of the tiered learning. And you run through multiple different courses. Um, analysts, my idea would be at least one a year for virtually their entire careers. And uh, so the first one is very simple. The first few are relatively simple. But if you have a three or five day war gaming experience, you're pretty immersed by the time you come out of it. Even if you haven't read the rules, it's just the white cell guy out there telling you the rules. Um, you're pretty immersed in, in the problem. You come away with a, a global experience that is uh, perceptual, conceptual, um, integrated um, with the, critically with that after action review. You really have to have people settle down and order and organize their thinking because of the welter of impressions that they take away. It's really chaotic until you bring it back to the beginning point. And you go through all those same questions again. Now, why did you have this hypothesis? What did you see at the start? Well, you guys over here, why didn't you do what they thought you were going to do? Well, we saw the world this way, so on and so forth. And all that discussion, which takes several hours, brings it all home. And then you, you wrap it up, you, you put a bow on it, you tie it, and you've got a learning experience. It's just an exposure. Um, but again, it, it's, it's part and parcel of... of uh, a lot of other training that analysts naturally go through. And in terms of time efficiency, uh, the number of days and hours required, it's, uh, and many analysts have said this many, many times in the feedback responses I get, it's the most rich learning experience um, that they've ever experienced, certainly in, in the government, over. So on the behalf of the junior college that is called Stanford University out in the Bay, 
I say this because I'm a Berkeley alum. How would you adapt this curriculum to teach at a university? I'm assuming civilian. And then would you be opening to doing so? Uh, I, it doesn't really need to be adapted because I'm teaching university students. So they come in, the, particularly the junior ones. They come in with, they sometimes they'll come out of a security studies or peace studies or regional studies or foreign area studies with some language, um, history, so on and so forth. Some of them are technical analysts who have no operational sense. They're radar analysts or they're electrical engineers. So they really have no background in warfare per se. So I take them as tabli rasa. I take them and I expect them to be highly intelligent, but deeply, well, ignorant is not a nice word, but, but you know, deeply not yet familiar with military affairs. I don't expect any prior learning. I take them step by step through it. This could go out to a civilian university in a heartbeat, and I, I would change nothing. I might, I, I might want to do it on an additional day to make it at least a full three-day course. I'm talking with a junior course. Um, and uh, yeah, no, the, the students would come, come away with a sound knowledge, and there would nothing be pitched over their heads, because those are the same students we hire, uh, and they're the junior folks, the nuggets, if you will, um, that we have to... Um, start training um, as soon as we uh, bring them into the building, over. Would I, so, oh, your next question was, would I be willing to do so? Uh, yes, with, uh, with permission of my command, of course, unless I take leave, in which case, you know, I would just tell them because it's like it's on class, it's fine. But yeah, I love doing it. It's, it's a lot of fun, totally cathartically draining, but a lot of fun, over. So David, you can go reach out to Tim yourself. Uh, David was the one who asked the question. Um, the last question I have is, how do you run into, uh, have you ever run into gamerism or uh, when a student or player is a gamer themselves and they uh, leverage essentially that knowledge uh, to win versus learn in during the game? That's an excellent question. I would dearly love to encounter that experience sometime. I'm constantly amazed at how little military orientation any of our students have. It's, it's, a different, it's a different world now. Back when I was young, and when the Cold War was almost hot, just like it is today, um, uh, we brought in people from the fleet, we brought in people from the force, and we brought in war geeks, because people were just really, really into it. Um, and their base knowledge, our base knowledge of the, the junior cadre was pretty solid. Uh, and uh, we didn't really need this kind of training quite so much. Actually, we did to integrate. It's the totality of the integration of it because everybody have bits and pieces here and there and their own knowledge will be from their career experience. But um, we did have a, a solid foundation of military familiarity and awareness. Whereas now our hiring process are, and, and policies and practices are very, very different. We're hiring um, tabli rasi. We're hiring blank slates. Highly intelligent, but with virtually no prior knowledge of military affairs. So I've only rarely encountered even anybody who's played Axis and Allies. Well, I played Risk in college and something I'll get, which is good, but that's not particularly relevant to, to military analysis. Um, one can play, you know, you can play Clue and that's not particularly relevant to, to intelligence analysis, although it doesn't hurt. Um, but uh, it does touch on evidential reasoning. But uh, no, I have not had that experience. Um, I have had people who do come in, though, um, in, the, in this middle tier um, with a lot of fleet experience. Um, and if they've had staff experience or if they think themselves honchos, they will often take charge. But that can actually be a good thing because learning flourishes under creative tension. If you have somebody driving red or somebody driving blue and, and driving their, their participants with a very uh, sensitive and aware, and you know, I not, don't come by that naturally, but I've learned to be very sensitive and aware as the uh, facilitator, you can really get a, a lot of active uh, dynamics from that kind of behavior. So I don't, um, uh, you know, uh, resent or have difficulty with the disruptive personalities because the disruptive personality can be reasonably you know directed um, down a, a path that's ideal for them and ideal for the team as a whole um, with just a little bit of nudge sometimes in, in facilitation um, if the facilitators 
sympathetic to both the, the hard driver um, and the, uh, the team as a whole, where many people can feel that they're being, that the, the driver is running roughshod over their voices. Uh, you always have to facilitate. One of the key things of facilitation is getting those who don't want to speak to feel comfortable speaking. And in that case, you do call them. You don't heckle them, but you, you do call on them. And, uh, and you make space for them to speak. And, uh, and, and it all can work out very well. But no, I, I've not really had, uh, I've had some war gamers. Actually, the war gamers are usually on the white team. <laughs> I said, you're a war gamer? Ah, can I borrow you? <laughs> because they'll learn how to learn the game quickly and they'll learn how to implement it. So they're usually part of the, the white team. And we do have some um, war gamers, but if they're war gamers, they really don't need the junior level basic warfare training. Over. So we like to end our webinar series uh, this year with a question that says, if you had unlimited funding and unlimited time and all the approvals and uh, that you need, uh, what game would you want designed or what kind of gaming program would you do initiative wise? Uh, and that's our last question for the night. Uh, I'm thinking that since somebody has done the hard work and is doing the hard work, uh, Colonel Barrick's operational wargaming system looks pretty promising. I mean, back in the, the 80s, I wanted to do, you know, Second Fleet, the Fleet series. But with all the work that's being done uh, and the relevance to current uh, scenarios, what I would like to do is have an integrated laboratory for intelligence analysis in the Office of Naval Intelligence, where we can combine both wargaming which creates an open, dynamic, uh, creative thinking kind of environment that generates hypotheses that we would wed with the intelligence methods of brainstorming and the structured analytic templates that, that create alternative hypotheses. And then put that in war gaming where we're testing out the basic parameters. Then you would take learning lessons from running cycles of these, just like the new war college did, doing it over and over again over the years, you know, um, and then move that into computational simulation gaming, say Storm or the joint theater level simulation or, or other uh, E-ring, um, N8, J8, um, uh, joint staff kinds of simulations and, and, and with contractors and run that and really test these hypotheses out and then really do rigorous uh, uh, adversary co-analysis really deep adversary critical capabilities and critical, critical vulnerabilities analysis, and then have a whole, what I wrote about in that Galileo paper I mentioned, a whole network of such laboratories across the intelligence community so that that all the, the, the NGIC would do it for the Army, NASIC would do it for the Air Force, um, CIA would do it, and we would all um, have our own uh, focal areas. So if it were to be a theater air, We'd send, we'd send people to NASIC, we would do it there, or we would uh, do it online uh, in the classified um, uh, wide area networks, and uh, which can, can be done just fine. And we would implement in that, um, particularly the online computational ones. Again, it's harder for the idea generation phases to do it uh, remotely, um, but it's not impossible. OWS though is a tabletop simulation. So um, that would be the ideal. I mean, re basically recreating with today's technology um, what the Naval War College does, but doing it for the intelligence side. Let's, let's tackle red. What we failed to do with the Naval War College in uh, the 1920s and 30s, because the Office of Naval Intelligence was uh, bureaucratically weak and was, uh, was run roughshod over by hard driving dynamic voices in OPNAV that uh, dismissed uh, red thread analysis by the experts and decided that they knew more. Uh, we didn't get a dynamic adversary. Well, here, if we can do it here, we can present that dynamic adversary and then we can carry forth our teams of trained analysts up to the War College, down to Maxwell Air Force Base, out to Army Command and Staff and start participating in their Title X games with really proficient threat representation. Um, and uh, with junior people, I mean, we, we send the senior people out and they're proficient, but you know, it takes 20 years to get senior. We can, we can now turn junior analysts two or three years into this career, um, into 
uh, analysts with the skill set and the knowledge and the ability to contribute to the uh, the, the Title X wargaming and the uh, intelligence support to uh, force planning and decision making at the highest levels of, of OpNav and the joint staff um, at, at a very junior level compared to the uh, 20 years of on the job training it takes to make uh, an expert if you do it the old fashioned way. Over. With that, I want to thank you, Tim, for your wonderful insights into how you're using uh, educational wargaming at ONI. Uh, for those who are interested in following up with Tim, you can see his email on the uh, on the slide, and our, his uh, slides will be available on our Google um, Share Drive, or not Share Drive, Google Drive, uh, which you can find the link into in our newsletter that goes out every Wednesday. Uh, for those who joined us on this Tuesday evening, thank you again, and thank you for all your amazing engagement and your questions. Uh, until another two weeks, we'll see you next time. Seb, thank you for this opportunity. I sincerely appreciate it. And everybody for participating, thank you very much. It's been a great, uh, great evening.